All right, we are live and the session is being recorded, so let's start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, great to see you here and uh, we're talking about the financing and input-led recovery today. Uh, our theme is around the impact of COVID-19 and uh, the impact of uh, the uh, global restrictions on uh, Russian fossil fuel exports, sanctions, uh, the economic regeneration based on impact investing principles uh, and the collaboration around the investors and governments and business leaders and the entrepreneurs to unlock the sustainable growth. Um, happy to introduce the speakers. Uh, Maria Fernanda Levis Peralta, Chief Executive Officer, Impactivo USA. Luis Gomez Cobo, founder and director, SLC Holdings Switzerland, and uh, <laughs> founder, Ish Opportunity USA. We'll start. We'll start with a brief introduction introduction about the overall economic situation, so that we can uh, then go to the questions, uh, which um, will just help us to unleash the expertise of each of the speakers, and then we'll discuss uh, all together. Uh, how we can advance the SDGs and what are our calls for actions. So in adversity of post-pandemic world and uh, geopolitical conflict, there is an opportunity to unlock sustainability growth and uh, an opportunity to urge innovations and uh, to implement their export innovations from developed countries to the emerging markets and developing countries. Uh, there is a gap in uh, financing the achieving of the 17 sustainable development goals and uh, it will take between 5 trillion to 7 trillion per year to achieve them till 2030 and the current investment gap in developing countries stands at about 2 trillion per year so here is where impact investing comes to the game what is impact investing? It is an investment made with the intention to generate positive, measurable, social and or environmental impact alongside a financial return. What is the criteria? Is it an impact investment or not? It's simple. If you remove the impact, you also remove the business. And uh, the impact should be easily measured and uh, the improvements in social and environmental space uh, should be visible and serve the unserved and underserved people and the planet. The private sector can play an instrumental role in closing the funding gap and uh, uh, the, it, the impact focused investing has already demonstrated the remarkable growth uh, over the last few years, and the market reached from 715 billion to 2.1 trillion, according to different estimates. So here, uh, where we are now, and there are more challenges uh, now in the second quarter of 2022. And uh, the question is: Will the current economic and uh, geopolitical situation urge us to innovate more? to do more impact investments uh, and to collaborate better. Where we are. So we see that there are risks uh, which are uh, cited as high risks for the current uh, economic growth, economic recovery. Uh, these are the high inflation rates uh, and the energy prices uh, and the supply chain disruptions and pandemic situations in some parts of the world. We see that China, which accounts for 12% of global trade, uh, is um, going through the lockdowns again, and it idled factories, it idled warehouses, slowed uh, truck deliveries, and uh, it is again uh, the situation last year with the container log jams, and the disruptions will ripple globally and extend through the year. So, we see that uh, new, new problems uh, are added, like nearly 50 countries depend on the Russian and Ukrainian uh, supply uh, of wheat, and uh, they, uh, at least 30% uh, 
of uh, the wheat input needs of those 50 countries depend on Russia and Ukraine. We see that uh, agriculture absorbs high amounts of energy directly and through the use of agrochemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, and uh, efficient trade flows are essential to meet global demand and safeguard food security. So last year we sought uh, the, pan the pandemic risks and supply chain disruptions uh, were our biggest challenges, but now we see that uh, more efforts and joint efforts are required to get back to the market. So uh, just uh, some highlights uh, where we are. And uh, as the uh, pandemic uh, is uh, the biggest uh, reason uh, of the economic crisis uh, which we've uh, been going through the last couple of years let's let's start with the pandemic and uh, with its effect uh, on on the economy and our ability to innovate and to recover uh, so our first speaker is maria fernanda and uh, the question is the following that pandemic affected patient care access for non-covid cases uh, your expertise is health and uh, you have experience with enrolling profitable, sustainable, high-quality patient-centered models in the developed market. But the question is, can it, can it also be uh, transferred to the developing markets? And can it unlock sustainable growth? What do you see as critical actions needed from governments, investors, business leaders, tech entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs to scale impact-driven businesses? to customize innovations to the individual country's needs? And what can public procurement and multilateral institutions do to address obstacles faced by impact-driven organizations like yours? So Natalia, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, Impactivo is a social impact consulting firm uh, and we've gotten into the technology space <laughs> with multiple uh, public health emergencies. So we're located in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico has been hit by hurricanes that knocked the entire power grid off uh, and had severe uh, problems with access to water and also all of the distribution lines were, were locked off. Uh, then we had a thousand earthquakes. Uh, we had an epidemic with Zika and then we hit the pandemic. So it was very funny because we were in these national calls about what we were going to do when the pandemic hit and our team was calm, cool, and collected. We've been through enough public health emergencies to know that there's frameworks that work for addressing these, these issues. And Puerto Rico is one of the places that has the highest vaccination rates eh, internationally, in part because of our previous experience with disasters. With respect to health, I think it all comes down to very honestly listening to the patient. Our firm specializes in data and assessments and personalization of workflows. And I would say that with respect to taking models that work in developed contexts and tailoring them to other areas of the world, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think local partnerships are necessary uh, and not local partnerships that are uh, cosmetic, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done in customization. So just to give you an example, when the hurricanes hit, one of the things I found our firm doing was figure, figuring out how to um, throw away carcasses, right? Something that we had no idea that, that was gonna happen. But the reason we were able to uh, address it was because we had boots on the ground, we had mechanisms for communication and what we do, our technology does assessments within the communities. We're working in 22 different municipalities. So we're able to gather data quickly on what the patients need. There are big issues with respect to trust. Uh, and trust, I think it goes from the business perspective. I think it goes from the perspective of patients and also from the perspective of procurement. So there was one thing that I think we all have to address is the issue of building trust. And we have seen it with um, vaccination rollouts throughout the world. People don't trust the science. Uh, and a lot of it I think is 
when we communicate, we're communicating from a place of how do we get more people to get vaccinated instead of how do we actually educate people in order to vaccinate, to, to provide a- adequate vaccination. Where should things be going uh, and what do entrepreneurs need? So I, I think that there is a real need for investment in innovation within the context that have the highest need. So it's not about developing innovation in academic centers or in cities that have a lot of uh, wealth. It's about going into the context and developing the, in, the intervention using human-centered design. And that's a lot of what, what we have been doing. In, in the United States, there's a fantastic program. It's called the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Uh, and it provides funding for entrepreneurs to do exactly this, this kind of work. And that works within the context of the United States. I, I think it would be fantastic if more of that work was done internationally to get innovation to where it needs to be. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I think I answered all the questions, right? <laughs> well, the question is um, uh, how public procurement and how multilateral institutions can help you to do more work internationally. Yeah, so um, we talked about this quite a bit yesterday. There is... A, a lot of need to structure processes that are transparent. So if you want entrepreneurs to engage with multilateral institutions, it's not about having them go to a lot of events where they have to meet a lot of people in order to figure out how they can then um, access the systems. One of the things that I like about the Small Business Innovation Research Program is everything's on the website, including how to apply. These are the rules. This is how it's scored. These are the the, um, different funding criteria. These are the needs. These are the priorities. And that level of transparency, they also allow you, if you're interested, to participate as a reviewer so you understand how the system is structured. And I find that even though I have relationships with multilateral institutions, the, the way that you connect is very... Um, difficult to to understand so more needs to be done to educate entrepreneurs and maybe these mechanisms exist and i'm just not in the in the right circle to figure it out uh but a lot more needs to be done around educating entrepreneurs to make those connections because otherwise entrepreneurs spend all of their time catering to government institutions instead of addressing the needs of communities which is where our attention needs to be uh, that's an absolutely fantastic point and uh, actually makes me think that uh, even if there is information which is uh, presented in a way that people who want to find it and who know what they're looking for can find, uh, it does not necessarily mean that uh, entrepreneurs, specifically from the developed countries who look for it for the first time, know how to use it and how, how to apply it for their specific cases. So more... Uh, easier ways of delivering information, disseminating this knowledge is required and more ambassadors probably. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. So back back to our economic uh, and geopolitical context. In the previous uh, two years, COVID came first and then uh, the supply chain crisis came. And uh, I'm getting uh, out question about the supply chain, chain, chain challenges. And those challenges have been on the top uh, risks since the beginning of the pandemic. And e-commerce businesses have taken the opportunity to compensate for disruption to traditional trading arrangements. The 2020 annual B2C e-commerce index published by UNCTAD Uh, which included 152 economies, showed substantial discrepancies between countries with high and low level of readiness and participation in e-commerce. And uh, those were broad and consistent uh, with demographic and uh, uh, developmental characteristics. However, each country from that index demonstrated... uh, bigger or smaller progress, but demonstrate progress in e-commerce um, adoption and penetration. Uh, Fahim, you've been in the e-commerce business for a long time. So can you please... Discuss- 
Thanks, Natalia. I think your connection got cut off a little bit, so I'll just repeat the end of the question, um, and then I'll answer it. I think uh, we want to focus a little bit more on what can e-commerce companies working with different institutions do to have a larger impact in developing markets, and how do we make sure we have social and environmental um, impacts that uh, that are continuing to progress. So, um, my, my background is uh, in e-commerce. Uh, I started an agency. We focus on helping brands scale um, uh, on e-commerce, primarily through the Amazon channel. Very familiar with many of the different models uh, that, are, that are happening. A little bit of feedback. Since, uh, can you guys tell me? It, it may have been, uh, on your so uh, I think when we all put ourselves on mute, it works better. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's start off with uh, why is it important? Uh, outside of altruistic reasons, why should e-commerce companies care about their sustainability and social impact? Um, and why why do they need to care about the environments that they're um, they're involved in outside of the bottom line? So first reason is the customer's care. Um, purpose-driven brands. Um, there was a study that showed brands that market their products as sustainable are seeing seven times the growth over traditional consumer product uh, companies. So the customer cares. Almost half of those customers are buying from brands that have a commitment to sustainability. Uh, I think it was a stat that said 52% of customers are more likely to purchase from a company that has shared values from them. So I think the, the first reason is that the customer does care. The millennial customer, particularly, cares a lot more. Um, there's a number of stats that say, I think it said 64% of millennials would not take a job with the employer if they didn't feel like they had a strong uh, uh, CSR policy. So customer, like the, the workforce wants to uh, be able to have a, a positive impact while they're providing um, uh, uh, shareholder value, so to speak. So let's say that the customer cares now. What can e-commerce companies do? Uh, e-commerce is one of those industries where it's largely dominated by a couple of major behemoths in, in every in every area. We talk about Amazon, the second largest employer in America, actually the fifth largest employer in the world right now. Um, they've talked a lot about in the last uh, several years their impact on environments that they they are hiring from. They want to have long-term programs that have a positive impact. They've done that uh, a lot with donations and disaster relief. Arguably, they could continue to do more, but it's been an area of focus for them. They just raised a billion dollars last year to invest um, primarily in climate and social causes uh, because of a lot of what they're hearing from customers. A lot of that's related to renewable energy, transport, greener buildings, and even affordable housing, which again, I think goes back to the social impact part of it. Outside of Amazon, if you look at um, Mercado Libre in South America, between Mexico and South America, they've done a lot to uh, generate economic and social and environmental impacts in their region, uh, both from the, the uh, employees that they're hiring to, to many of their, their sourcing um, practices. If you look at Jumia in Africa, they just released a couple of days ago their first environmental social governance report. So that's actually a big deal because it's not... Uh, something that I think has been done uh, nearly as often in the region. They're talking a lot about their sustainability practices and, um, and, and their social impact. Zada in Southeast Asia, similarly, they've done a ton through uh, the COVID pandemic to help customers between price gouging, uh, preventing price gouging, helping businesses get online quicker, fundraising, donating medical supplies, etc. So I think um, uh, to, to summarize, there is... This is not an industry that I think has been known for social impact reasons. 
it's oftentimes about the bottom line and when you become public or you're raising a lot of money, uh, uh, oftentimes that becomes a primary focus. I think given everything we've seen uh, happen um, with the pandemic and, and our post-pandemic world, so to speak, I think it's not only important to serve the end customer and make it more convenient for them, but also for the companies that are doing that to be very focused on that entire um, value chain from the people that they're employing and empowering to, to the people that are working in the warehouses, to the brands that are creating products that want to sell on those platforms. Um, I think across the board, there's increasingly more focus there on, um, on areas of sustainability and, and social impact. And, and I'm hoping that that doesn't go away um, as the pandemic hopefully fades away in the, in the foreseeable future. Rahim, can I ask uh, one more question? If you, as a successful entrepreneur working in the developed market, decide to export your business model to a developing market, how will you do it? What kind of support will you need? How you will measure your success? How you will make impact and profits alongside? I think so. It's a good question. I mean, there's um, the easiest way is leveraging some of those larger e-commerce marketplaces that already have created that footprint. Uh, last mile delivery is not an easy thing in many developing markets, as, as we know. Many of those markets are still um, uh, focused on cash on delivery models, which are, are don't. Um, they're very different than the models that I think developed markets have looked at. So I think there are a number of startups and emerging organizations that try to do this. But I think the more pressure that can continue to be applied to the to the Lazadas and to the Jumias and the Mercado Libres and Amazon, and the more that they continue to um, adapt their model to make sure that they're not only focused on making money, but also uh, helping the uh, economies that they are, um, that they're in. I think that's probably going to be the easiest way. So if you're an entrepreneur that has a really interesting um, social good impact on a clothing or pill brand. I think it becomes a lot easier now than it was five years ago to launch those products in emerging markets, taking advantage of some of those marketplaces and um, uh, partnering with companies that already know how to finish um, that process and, and not starting it from scratch. Because again, I think uh, uh, just the supply chain model is so different. Some of those the organizations that you have to be able to to lean on um, the experts in the industries and, and those markets to do that. Fantastic. So you mentioned affordable housing as well. And uh, in uh, many markets, it's uh, a part of the ecosystem which is required in order to boost the trade and uh, to bring more consumers to the specific location. So I, I think it's a very valuable example of the affordable housing initiatives of the big players. All right, so we talked about pandemic, um, we talked about supply chain disruptions, uh, and uh, now let's get to uh, present time uh, and uh, talk about uh, the influence of the geopolitical instability uh, on the developed and developing markets. Uh, Louis, uh, there is a question to you. Can you discuss how the geopolitical instability combined with market conditions, with high prices of energy, fertilizers, other agricultural ser services is resulting into food security challenges. And uh, taking this as an example, do you think that uh, SDGs should be reprioritized? Re uh, which SDGs you see as priorities for the private sector? Can private sector play an instrumental role in closing the SDG's investment gap these days? Uh, what can be the role of multilateral institutions uh, in a collaborative web of trust-based relations? And can those relations empower impact-led investors and entrepreneurs? Thank you, Natalia. So, certainly we're, we're in a I know where disruptions, as we were listening a moment ago, caused by the pandemic, the geopolitical repositioning that we're looking at, and also the financial challenges that we're looking at 
that are driven by the end of almost two decades of continuous enlargement of money pumping economic policies. Yeah, this is unwinding in our eyes, I believe now. And you know, this market exuberance that we have is, is presenting an, yet another challenge, no? Uh, where, where investors, entrepreneurs face a different set of uh, economic and financial uh, challenges for, for the business. And under this light, we need to think on how we can keep our world on track of creating better societies that really give human beings the opportunity to be the best versions of themselves. And also, at the same time that we respect ecosystems, and I'm not talking about business ecosystems, I'm talking about the real ecosystems where the world comes from, <laughs> uh, in which we are part of, and that we allow our world to also be the best version of itself. We need, we need to think about those two things. And actually, when you read the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, you can block them into two groups. One, one group that gives human beings the potential to be the best version of themselves, no hunger, no poverty. Okay? And the other one that creates ecosystems that allow the world to be the best version of itself. And, you know, Okay, climate change, life underwater, life on Earth. You see that it's actually very clearly divided. And let me just talk a bit of a philosophical point first. We, we I'm, I'm a firm believer that the most effective way of value creation is free markets and it's entrepreneurs. Okay? And also I'm a firm believer that the supercharger for this wealth creation to be well distributed and to improve relationships between human beings and, between, and with nature is consciousness, is the understanding of our impact in the world. Because no human being will actually do badly if he's absolutely conscious of the impact of every action that he has, that he or she does. So think about it. You know, a, a business person, will a business person pollute if really understands the impact of the pollution on the ecosystem and the world and at the end of his bottom line? Makes no sense. Okay. Will you pay your employees low? Will you not hire a, a, a woman because it's, it's a woman? No. It it's, it's makes absolutely no sense on the business perspective, on the human being perspective. And, and Having this level of consciousness is really important. Now, let me go back to your question. The 17 goals are important. <laughs> and, and when you talk about private sector, the private sector is huge. No? We have people working on all 17 goals in the private sector. So we cannot just pinpoint or let's look at this or let's look at that. But I'll try you know, on myself to, to apply it and say, okay, how can I work in that? And the first one I think is no poverty. And, you know, I, I grew up in a family, you know, a farmer, you know, that worked hard every day. As he said, you know, what I give to society is employment to the people that work with us. And that's, that's the best thing I can give them. I'm not giving away money, and I, I'm giving them work, and I'm giving the ability to have a better life and to send their kids to school. And, and really... Money is not printed, in, it's not created in central banks. They print it and they print as much as they want. But value and wealth is created by businesses, by entrepreneurs. And they can actually do it when they are in healthy communities, in places that are sustainable. So our role as entrepreneurs is to decrease poverty by creating wealth. And do it consciously so that it's well distributed. And that goes to decent work and economic growth. So pay your people well, that's goal number eight. You know? Pay your people well, you know? treat them decently. Allow them to have, you know, the father uh, days off. And make sure that they have a, a positive life as part of, of, of the company they work for and as part of the society. Okay. And that brings again to reduce inequalities. If you create a company and as an entrepreneur, you work hard and you give 
every people that work in your business the opportunity to have the very basic and then on top of that more of what they should get you are actually improving and working towards number 10 which is reducing qualities uh, and then we have the affordable and clean energy which is again from my perspective because i'm in that business uh, but it's something that as we look into this industry we see that more and more the user of the energy will be also the producer of the energy and will be the storer of the energy so when you say closing the investment gap that's actually a very good point in energy why because more and more the technology allows that the companies generate their own electricity and store their own electricity and instead of having big either private or state-owned central generation power plants what we have is a distributed generation that's actually in the hands of the final user which are the companies in itself and also even the consumers on their houses so this is a very easy way to close the investment gap is to have governments multilateral institutions work and push strong into the distributed generation really empower and use these technologies to allow the, the the companies to build more local generation it makes absolute sense you don't have to be, be, build large transmission lines you don't need to leave big plots of area just to put solar panels or wind turbines as more as you can distribute where the energy is used is the most efficient thing we can do and that's that's a very easy way to close the investment gap in in, in what's in, in energy relates to and I would go to number 17, just to finish on this, which is partnership for the goals. And what I would say is don't give up on, on globalization. No? Uh, what we're seeing is that the world is looking like splitting in two, no? since that someone took a knife and we're reversing three decades of, of integration. No? And, and for many different reasons. Uh, and then we see a lot of this is saying you know, local production is important. Yes, local production is really important, but the only sustainable, the only truly sustainable growth is one that it creates a global community. If we don't have a global community, everything that we build will be destroyed sooner or later, as we're seeing today. Why? Because when we see that we see ourselves as adversaries in a global community, sooner or later one destroys the other. So we need to we need to keep thinking about this global community that we're part of and build as partners that we are. Thank you. Chris. And what about the zero hunger goal, uh, SDG number two? So we see we see how uh, the energy prices, the supply chain disruptions, uh, the geopolitical crisis. Uh, bring us back to the years uh, when the number of people starving was growing. Now the number was declining and now uh, it's growing again. So we can talk uh, about e-commerce, we can talk about infrastructure, innovations, but uh, if the basic security needs uh, is not addressed for millions of people, uh, what we as investors and entrepreneurs should do how we should reprioritize our activities in sh should we go beyond our fields of expertise uh, create more jobs look for other innovations how do you think as an as, a, as an investor who can decide where to put money yeah that's a good question so i think i think the first thing is when no, because the people that are suffering hunger today are certainly not clients for an entrepreneur. No, uh, these are this requires a much more immediate action. No, there is no time to build a business to feed this kid that is suffering hunger today. No? This requires immediate action, and thanks God we have multilateral institutions. We have companies and in the private and and, and multilateral companies, uh, groups that. Uh, are able to support in that sense. And I believe as, 
as entrepreneurs, as business people, the best thing we can do to satisfy this first definition of hunger, hunger now, is to support the current institutions that are already there. Creating an additional one or a, comp a competition to that doesn't help. We need to make the ones that are already there strong and support them, you know, and, and see how we can support those, those value chains uh, in terms of feeding the hungry today. Uh, then it's hunger tomorrow, no? hunger in the future. How can we work towards making sure that nobody suffers hunger in the future? No? That this doesn't repeat over and over again. No? Uh, you, all of us, you may recall we are the world, no? the sun has set us for hunger, and we're still there. No? <laughs> Nothing has changed that much, or I don't know, in that sense. No? But I, I do feel that we're just in this endless circle no? where we know there's enough food, we know there's enough, enough resources, and we're just not allocating them properly. So I, I do believe that entrepreneurs should look at these opportunities to work uh, towards food redistribution and logistic chains, value transfer into the communities that can fall into hunger. No? Not just the ones that are ready there, but the ones that may fall in the future. And, and we need to think about these logistic chains and how to redistribute food in the world. Because yes, certainly there is a problem now with the amount of grain that is being produced, but how much of the grain that is being produced today, even under these current circumstances, will in, end up in the waste bin? It's so much food that's just wasted and badly used. And I, I do think that that for me would be a key point. If, if there is something to do in that sense, it's, it's more saturation too avoiding waste yeah, and, uh, and, and, and then using the food to relocate it to, to the places where it's actually needed mm -hmm. not just where it's better paid and i i think uh maria fernanda back to your point uh about knowing the local needs and creating innovations not on the developed markets but going into the problems and uh, solving them on site uh, we see the obvious link with uh, uh, fighting the hunger in the future, with uh, setting the uh, sustainable patient uh, focused models for the healthcare and also the logistics innovations uh, in a more affordable way so that people can get faster through the affordable infrastructure, uh, the goods, the basic, which satisfy their basic needs. Uh, well, so we have about seven minutes left, and um, I have, I suggest we discuss two questions all together. First, what else we can do to scale up innovations as entrepreneurs and investors? And secondly, what are your specific recommendations and the uh, call for actions that you would like to make as your concluding remarks? Uh, Fahim, maybe we start with you. Yeah, thanks. Um... I think to reiterate some of the points, I think it's um, being very deliberate. Um, I, there was a, I was reading an analysis that said that they analyzed the 17 um, sustainable development goals, and at least 10 of them are linked to e commerce and can be uh, incorporated. So I think continuing to, I, I also uh, agree with Lewis, is very much on the free market philosophy. If the consumers continue to show that they care about these, uh, about sustainability, about where products are being sourced from and the environmental impact, then I think the largest companies, the Amazons, the Jumias, the Elizadas must um, react and adapt and the more intentional and deliberate they are and making sure that they're doing things that are um, meeting some of those sustainable goals, I think the, the quicker and the larger the impact will be. Um, I think in addition to that, kind of sourcing is going to be a, like you said, with the supply chain crisis and with uh, container issues and and a number of different um, factors that have continued to proliferate over the last year. I think thinking about where you're, you're sourcing products, if there's an opportunity to source products from local environments, um, and if some of those cost barriers continue to, to get blurred. As part of it, I think there's a huge opportunity to do a better job of showcasing local products through platforms and empowering entrepreneurs and, 
and emerging brands and even established brands in those regions, as opposed to also looking at the low cost option, which ultimately the, will be dependent on what the customer is choosing. So I think uh, to close, um, there is a huge responsibility that um, brands and retailers and e-commerce companies have in, in meeting some of these goals. And I, th- uh, I hope and believe they are up to the task. Thank you, Fahim. That, that's a great point about the responsibility of uh, big and mid-sized players when uh, they are exporting their models. And indeed, it's important to showcase the products uh, of local entrepreneurs and give them the stage and uh, communicate to them, as uh, Maria Fernanda mentioned earlier, communicate to them that there are tools and uh, then they are welcomed and uh, that they can make money on that. Uh, Maria Fernanda, what uh, are your concluding remarks and uh, how do you think we, what else we can do to scale up innovations? So um, from the perspective of scaling innovation, so one of the things is providing the information for entrepreneurs. The second one is piggybacking on the institutions that already exist. I'm here because I'm a member of Entrepreneurs Organization which is a network of over 10,000 entrepreneurs internationally, that not all of them are focused on SDG. There's a big part of our community that is. Uh, So I think that, you know, if I was going to say one recommendation for government and multilateral institutions would be to build off of that infrastructure that already exists. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. So you really do have to find folks that have that entrepreneurial um, mindset to solve problems. Uh, I will say something else as as a concluding remark. After the pandemic, what we have been left with, and remember we've come from multiple uh, public health emergencies, is worldwide trauma. Um, So there's a real mental health issue. And I I am going to say it in every single forum that I can be in, because it's not just an issue of having health systems that provide services. It really is about how we as employers take care of our people, how communities take care of their people. So there are spaces where I think that there's not enough government investment. That would be one, uh, because we keep on seeing mental health as a disease, right? Or as a pathology. But what we're really seeing is the need for more positive psychology or just different mindsets and attitudes, particularly with young young people. So we're talking about what's coming in the future. We have an entire generation that was locked up, unable to socialize, had deficient education for about a year and a half, maybe two years. And we are seeing the effects on that on the, that generation. So uh, attention needs to be paid. And this is from a social perspective, but the capacity of entrepreneurs to solve social problems is extraordinary. I'll end with one note. There's an organization called Impossible Labs. If you have not looked them up, look them up. They do fantastic work contextualizing innovation to areas that have needs. Uh, And they've been able to do, for example, in Los Angeles, where there's significant inequality, uh, they've been able to craft market solutions that uh, address hunger. Sorry to interrupt you. Luis, one minute for your concluding remarks, please. Maria Fernanda, sorry. Well, I think uh, I'll go back to my last point. Uh, We really need to understand that we live in this interconnected society and that we grew up all of us, our business lives have been around the, the concept of globalization and logistic chain integration and all these things. And we really need to continue to work on that. We need to continue to build this global community and build this interconnected society that creates so much value. Tend to be more. And uh, Maria Fernanda, as you said, uh, entrepreneurship not for everyone. So we should be joining efforts and uh, see what we can do to scale impact investments and innovations. All right. So I think uh, our original session time has elapsed. And uh, let's let's conclude uh, on that. Uh, it, it was exciting to... Uh, 
and thank you all for all the insights. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coordinating, Natalia, and great to meet everyone. Yeah, Natalia, thank you so much. Um, yeah, pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.